Good morning. You know, I was thinking uh, that a lot of times we say things that we don't really intend them to be the way we answer thing. And, and I, was, uh, I was thinking about uh, the time that I went to the VA hospital to get some stints removed from my back because I had a, you know, and uh, there was a young doctor that, uh, that took care of me, you know, and I, I, I said, uh, are they keeping you busy? And he said something that he shouldn't have said. He said, well, when the line is free, it gets real long. And I said, what do you mean by that, man? I said, we've already paid for this. Some people have paid with their own lives for the services we're getting now, and, and he apologized. I, uh, and, and he said something that he meant in a certain way, but not to be, you know, wrong about it, but I'm sure that he would never answer that question again that same way. I just wanted to bring that out because uh, it served him a lesson. But anyway, the scripture today uh, is from uh, 2 Kings 17, 13 to 15, 32 to 33, and 18, 1 to 7a. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers, and seers turn from your evils, your evil ways, observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your ancestors to obey and that I delivered to you through my servants and prophets. But they not only and were as stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and covenants he had made with the, with the ancestors and, and statues, and he warned them to keep, that he warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. They in, imitia, in, imitated the nations around them Although the Lord had ordered them, do not do, the, do, not do it, do not do the, that. They worshiped the Lord, but they also appointed all sorts of their own people to officiate for them as priests in the, in the shrines at the high places. They worshiped the Lord, but they also served their own gods in accordance with their customs and the, of the nations from which they had been brought. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elijah, of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king and, re and re regained in, 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 in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as the father David had done. He removed the high places, smarted the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for up to the, that time the Israelites had been burned, burned in incense to it. It was called Nusha. Hezekiah trusted the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one but him among the kings of Judah. Either before him or after him, he had held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept his, the commands the Lord had given Moses and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook, and he rebelled against the king of Asia and did not serve him. Praise be to God. I know some of you are thinking, 
with that scripture reading, you better give me a little bit of time back on the sermon end of this. <laughs> uh, well, let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, the opportunity you give me to preach, to proclaim your word. Pray, Father, always that we would all see you above and beyond any words I might speak, that, Lord, you would supersede, in a sense, any mistakes I make, any blunders that come out of my mouth, and by your Holy Spirit just infuse the message that people here today need to hear, and everybody needs to hear something different, and I pray, Father, that happens. So, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a saying that's been around for several years now. I know you've heard it before. You are what you eat. (laughs) And uh, that certainly has some truth to it on a physical level, the way we look and the way we feel physically is certainly influenced by the things we choose to put into our mouths. I know you've known that to be true for yourself. So using that same analogy this morning from a spiritual perspective, I would like to propose to you this morning that the Bible teaches this truth. You are what you trust. Whatever holds your main allegiance, whatever is paramount or preeminent in your life, whatever you look to or choose to bring meaning and fulfillment and purpose to your life, whatever that is, that is what you trust. And that is what is shaping the person you are becoming. And the idea of trust is with us from the very beginning of the Bible, the very first story Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. What was their first sin? Well, people say they ate the apple or the fruit. I know. But why? What was their motivation? Some, well, yeah, you can answer. <laughs> Some people have said pride for, is, is one motivation there because the serpent tells them If you eat this fruit, you will be like God. So pride comes in. Some people say it's the sin of lust. Because the woman, it says, saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Well, both of those motivations are evident in this story. But there is something that's even more basic. Something that set them up for pride and lust. And it is this. Mistrust. I want to propose to you this morning that mistrust lies at the heart of any and all sin. God said one thing and Adam and Eve chose to believe and do something else. And behind that desire is the notion, hey, you know what? Maybe God doesn't have our best interest at heart. God says, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat on your wife or your husband. Keep one day a week set aside for rest and spiritual nourishment. And something deep inside of us says, you know, maybe God's some kind of control freak. Maybe God's trying to keep me from having a good time. Or maybe our thought processes are a little more subtle than that. The Bible story of Adam and Eve tells us that the serpent was crafty. You know, we can be pretty crafty ourselves in our own thinking about ourselves, in our own rationalizations. You know, we could, we could think like this. Yeah, I know that's what God says. But you know, in this particular circumstance, that just doesn't seem right. I mean, this other thing that that I'm looking at, uh, this other choice, would really make me happy. So that's what I'm going to do. After all, you know, surely 
God wants me to be happy, right? He'll understand. Mistrust. We really doubt sometimes that God wants what's best for us. We think He has some other motive perhaps. And then we begin to set ourselves up for bad choices which leads to sin, which causes pain for ourselves and others who are affected by our decisions. And it all begins with who or what we trust or don't trust. If we put our trust in anything other than God, our lives become meaningless. And I mean that in an ultimate sense. If we put our trust in anything other than God, our lives become meaningless. In the passage we read earlier, uh, the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, were invaded by the Assyrians and they were taken into exile. And then the Scripture tells us that it happened for particular reasons. God sent them prophets to warn them and He tells them His ways and what He expects and what He desires and wants for them. And then notice, uh, we, we don't have it up on the screen, but in verses 14 and 15, it says this about the people. They did not trust the Lord their God. They rejected His decrees. They rejected His covenant. They rejected His warnings. And then what happened? Well, when you reject God, when you reject His ways, where do you find meaning in your life? How are you going to find meaning? You've separated yourself from God. He's the one who really gives you meaning. He's the one who created you. He's the one who knows you. So what do you do? Verse 15, it says, they thought, notice this, they followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. You see? You are what you trust. If you worship things that are worthless, then your life ultimately becomes worthless. In other words, you're robbed of any meaning or purpose in your life is what God wants to give you. So first comes... Belief, what you believe, what you put your trust in, they follow worthless idols. And notice the next action that happens, it says in that same verse, they imitated the nations around them. Although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do, and they did the things the Lord had forbidden them to do. If you shut off God, you're going to look for meaning somewhere else. So you're going to look at it at your culture, your society, you're going to start doing what everybody else is doing, because they, they say, hey, I, this is where I find my meaning. This is where I find my purpose. Try it. Okay? So notice the progression. When you mistrust God, you will search for meaning somewhere else, and you will search for it in something bigger than yourself. And then whatever you follow, if it's not God, besides God, it is ultimately worthless. That's what the Scripture says. And then you will begin to buy into the world's system, the world's way of finding meaning and purpose. And when you do that, you will cease to be the unique individual God created you to be. And you will begin imitating the world. So if we're honest, we like to have it both ways. We actually want God in our lives and still live life the way we want to. And that's exactly what the Israelites tried to do. That's why we read verses 32, 33. Let me read them for you again. It says, They worshiped the Lord, but they also appointed all sorts of their own people to officiate for them as priests in the shrines at the high places. Again, it says, They worshiped the Lord, but they also served their own gods in accordance with the customs of the nations from which they had been See, they, they still wanted God in their lives, but they kind of wanted Him as an appendage. They wanted to compartmentalize Him. They wanted, in a sense, to keep God in a box. Kind of like we're prone to do if we're not careful. You know, we've got a box for everything. We've got a box for work. We've got a box for school. We've got a box for family. We've got a box for friends. 
And then we have a box for God. We want to trust God, but we want to trust other things too. So let me quickly give you three examples of other things we tend to put our trust in. The first one is, sometimes we put our trust in other people. Maybe our spouse, or a parent, or a mentor, or a hero, or even a friend. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you can't trust some people. I'm saying you can't put your trust in other people. There's a big difference. If you put your trust in another person, I want to tell you, you will ultimately be disappointed every time, at some point. It may be sometimes even disillusioned. The psalmist went through such a time. Listen to his words. He said this, Even my bosom friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. And, and, this is, and the truth is, even good people who aren't traitors will disappoint you. Why? Because they're human. Because they're not perfect. Because they're not like God, ultimately. Listen again to the psalmist. Put not your trust in princes, people who are over you. You might even admire them. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no help. When his breath departs, he returns to his earth. And on that day, his plans perish. And if you put your trust in him, your plans perish on that day too. Oswald Chambers, in his classic devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest, addresses this very problem. He says this, If I put my trust in human beings, I will end in despairing of everyone. I will become bitter because I have insisted on man being what no man can ever be. Absolutely right. Never trust anything but the grace of God in yourself or anyone else. I have to tell you, many people who have been hurt by other Christians and then left the church have made this very mistake because people aren't perfect. They trusted in people who they thought were good and someone disappointed them. And they became bitter and they left. They put their trust in somebody who didn't deserve that kind of adoration or that kind of burden. Because in reality, no person does deserve that type of ultimate trust. So, trusting in people is one way. Another one... It's kind of trusting in ourselves, trusting in our own strength. The psalmist said this, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Think about that in terms of America. In America, we are fiercely independent. We believe in picking ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And I want to tell you, that's not a bad quality to have. It's, it's a certain amount of that individualism is very good. But here's the thing. In the final analysis, we are all finite. We are all temporary as far as existence goes. We don't have enough resources within ourselves to make it through this life alone. We need some help. And most importantly, we need some divine help. And the third one, is many times people, and we have a tendency, trust in wealth and possessions. Once again, the psalmist said, Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of my persecutors surrounds me? Men who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches. Truly, no man can ransom himself or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of his life is costly and can never suffice that he should continue to live on forever and never see the pit. In other words, death is a great equalizer. There is only so much comfort that wealth and possessions can bring. We all have a tendency, and we like to think sometimes, especially when we're down on our finances, that money can buy happiness. Well, we thought it was kind of clever, the, the, the guy that came up with the quote, I've been rich and I've been poor, 
rich is better, you know. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, wealth and possessions can even become a huge burden. Those of us who've never had it don't think of it that way. I, I, a few years ago, I read, I, I was never a big Pink Floyd fan when it comes to rock groups. But I read something a few years ago about a guitarist in a rock band, rock band named David Gilmore. Listen to this. He sold his home for six and a half million dollars. This was several years ago. And gave it all to a charity that helps homeless people. Why? He said he had grown tired of having too many expensive possessions. Here's his quote. You collect Ferraris and then you've got to collect people to look after your Ferraris, and you've got to collect buildings to house the Ferraris, life gets very complicated. Interesting. Now all of that that we've talked about is from the negative vantage point. From mistrusting God and placing your trust in other things that won't give us the dividends and won't give us the value in our lives that we desperately seek. So what exactly does trust in God look like from a positive angle? And that's why we read so many different passages. That's why we read the second passage today in the next chapter of 2 Kings about King Hezekiah in Judah in the southern kingdom. Notice what it says about him, what it said about him in verses 5 and 6. It said this about him. He trusted in the Lord. There's the word. He didn't mistrust. He trusted in the Lord. What followed? It says he held fast to the Lord. He did not cease to follow Him. He kept His commandments. He had a belief. He trusted in God. He believed that God had His best interest at heart. And that belief followed in choices and actions. So let's see. Just as mistrusting God leads to bad choices, which leads to sin, which causes pain in our lives and to the people around us, so too... Trusting God leads to choosing His ways, which leads to our lives counting for something that has ultimate value. And that in turn also influences the other people around us. Verse 7 in that passage said this, And the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. Because Hezekiah trusted God. He had a great positive influence over the entire nation of Judah. It wasn't easy. In fact, notice the choice of the words. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow Him. The Assyrians were breathing down His neck. He could have tried to cut a deal. He could have compromised His convictions. Do what seemed wise and smart by the world's standards. Instead, he chose to trust the Lord. You know, sometimes it's hard to hold fast to the Lord, isn't it? Sometimes life gets so complicated and we don't see God like we think we ought to be able to see Him and it just gets difficult to not cease to follow Him. It gets hard. You know, if I, when I think about that, I think about the story of Job. I'm not going to tell the whole story. You don't have time. But you know, everything bad that could possibly happen to you happened to Job. Loss of family, fortune, everything boils on your skin. Notice this. When he's confronted by his friends, he says this. Talking about God. Though He slay me, though He kills me, yet I will trust paradox of this is this. Trusting God is the easiest way to live life, but often trusting God is the hardest thing to do. So I want you to go away this morning certain of this basic truth. God is on your side. He really is. That's why you can trust Him. The Apostle Paul put it this way so eloquently. I've told you this before, but in the book of Romans, I love Romans 8, my favorite chapter in the whole Bible. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? 
And in the Greek language, when you wanted to emphasize something, you left off the B form of the verb. So literally what he wrote is, if God for us, who against us? doesn't matter who's against us. Okay? Because if God's for us, we can trust Him. It goes on in Romans 8 to say, He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, Will He not also freely give us all things? And we can trust a God like that, even in life's most difficult circumstances. Corey Ten Boom, if you don't know who she is, I, I can't give you her whole story. She helped hide Jews in World War II. She and her family were taken to a concentration camp. She was not Jewish herself. The book's called The Hiding Place. If you haven't read it, read it. Anyway, this is a quote from her. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. I love that. I used this story in a communion meditation. It's been a few months ago now. But it's so perfect for, to end this sermon. Louisa Steed felt the call to the mission field at an early age. And that call or that dream was hindered due to her frail health. She wasn't healthy enough to go. And at age 25, she married and later gave birth to a beautiful baby girl named Lily. And as Louisa Steed and her husband and their little daughter were enjoying an oceanside picnic one day, a drowning boy offshore called for help and Mr. Steed ran into the water to save him. But he was pulled under by that terrified boy. Both he and the boy drowned that day as Louisa and her daughter watched helplessly. Not long after that, she wrote a song, wrote a poem that was put to a melody that many of you have heard before. It goes like this. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to rest upon His promise Just to know, thus saith the Lord Then she wrote a second verse and think about this verse in context of the story I just told you. I'm so glad I learned to trust You, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that You are with me, will be with me to the end. You know the song, sing the chorus with me. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. You are what you trust. And if you trust Jesus, you become more like Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for the truth, the real truth, that You are worthy of our trust. No matter how hard life gets, no matter how difficult it is, no matter when you see me hidden and we can't actually maybe see your hand in the moment, we can still trust you. We can trust an unknown future to a known God. And the, and, and the, the thing that's so true, and I, I know I say it a lot, Lord, but the truth, if we've put our tra- trust and our faith in you, the worst thing that ever happens to us, whatever it is, the worst thing that ever happens to us will never be the last 
Help us to trust you more. And as we trust you more, and we put our hands in the life of your Son, may we become more and more and more like Jesus, the one we trust. It's in his name we pray. Amen.